friends to another episode of the Dark Assassins Podcast, the show that dives deep into not just technology, but the concepts, software, and procedures behind it all, and explains it so simply that even your grandma can understand it. As always, I'm your host, the Dark Assassin. I hope all of you had a happy Thanksgiving, seeing that this episode is coming live to you after Thanksgiving, Uh, but for me, it is happening before Thanksgiving, um, since I'm recording it before, obviously, but um, I am about to do something that is probably fairly sacrilegious, because I'm about to shoehorn computer science and software development into somewhere it has no business being, that being into Thanksgiving. And that is coming up later in this episode, so be sure to stay for that. But first, let's start off with our trivia question, and we are going to be doing something a little bit different this week for our trivia question. So rather than me giving you some piece of trivia and you have to give me the answer. Rather, I'm going to still do that, but with a little bit of a twist, we're going to introduce some audio into this week's trivia question. I mean, after all, this is a podcast, uh, which is, you know, audio based. So this week's trivia question is the following audio comes from which operating system? And here is that audio. Which operating system did that absolute banger of a song come from? And that is your trivia question for the week. So operating systems, as you well know, uh, have to have some pretty good security because... You know, people are going to be using the operating systems and them being hacked and, you know, have ransomware infect them and all that stuff is obviously less than ideal. Um, And one way to combat, you know, uh, different types of malware and improve your your cybersecurity awareness is to hear a cybersecurity tip. So let's get into this week's cybersecurity tip. <laughs> This week's cybersecurity tip is one of the basic ones, I would say, and that would be always make sure that your personal data is encrypted. And I think this is becoming a bigger deal, obviously, in um, in recent years, uh, say, compared to you know, the early 2000s or the 90s or the intro to computing, you know, back in the 70s and 80s. Because nowadays, a lot of your personal information is online, not just like on the web, but like digital on your either your computer's hard drive, SSD, flash drive, network attached storage, you know, it's in a lot of different places in a digital format. And that's obviously not good if a, you know, threat actor somehow gets a hold of that because, you know, if they get access to something like your bank account information or your social security number, uh, I mean, you're just asking for all kinds of various types of fraud to happen. So one way to prevent that is to ensure that all that data be encrypted. Um, and I mean, is you think about it with all the various kinds of things that you probably have on your computer, whether that's like medical records that you have digit 
digitized medical records, tax returns, other tax information, bank information from job applications. You know, there's a bunch of different ways that you would have personal information stored on your computer. And you obviously want to make sure that you encrypt that. Now, one of the easiest ways to do that is to just encrypt the entire drive. Uh, but sometimes that's not necessarily feasible or all that practical because depending on the operating system, you may have to completely wipe the operating system in order to set up drive encrypt disk encryption. Uh, another option is depending on what operating system you're on, uh, you might not have access to be able to encrypt your disk. Now, with even if you do fall into that category, um, like I think the most basic version of Windows, at least it didn't used to have the BitLocker, which is their like disk encryption thing. I don't think it used to have that. Uh, it might be different now, uh, but you could still go with some third-party solution to do your disk encryption. But even if you don't do any of that, you could still encrypt it manually with, you know, some kind of, you know, RSA key, some, you know, PGP, something like that. Um, so th there are definitely ways that even if you can't do a full disk encryption, you could still encrypt your data. And there's a couple benefits to one versus the other um, if you do full disk encryption, the benefit there is if someone does get a hold of your device or the drive inside it, unless it's soldered to the motherboard, um, they wouldn't be able to access your data unless your computer was already booted up and unlocked. Because in most cases, in order to decrypt the drive, you have to actually boot the computer up and enter some kind of password or something in order to decrypt the drive, and then you boot into the OS. Uh, the problem there is if you're already booted into the OS, everything's already decrypted. Um, so if someone gets to your computer when it's booted, uh, you kind of run into an issue potentially. Um, so that could be one reason why you might want to um, do a secondary encryption specifically of your personal data with some kind of like RSA type key, um, something like that. Um, but then <laughs> you could potentially run into another issue of, you know, your, your private key being stored on your computer. And then if the attacker got your computer and was unlocked, they could access your private key. Um, but depending on how you configure it, you could potentially require a password even to decrypt, even if uh, obviously, you'd have the private key, but you'd still maybe require a password or something. Um, so there's definitely you know ways around it. But obviously, these are kind of assuming that you would have an attacker um, you know take your device or whatever, um, which I guess is credence to the argument that if you ever do any kind of traveling uh, to ensure that your device is fully shut down before you travel. So in the event sometime during your traveling, uh, your device gets stolen from you, it would obviously be powered off and therefore the entire disk would be encrypted, assuming you're doing the full disk encryption way. Um, so yeah, there's there's a bunch of different ways you can go about it, but at the end of the day, you want to make sure that all your personal data is encrypted, and because you know we obviously don't want the the cloud providers and the all the various companies and governments out there, you know, getting access to our data. Uh, but it's even worse if we have the data ourselves. Uh, on our own device and someone still gets access to it because we didn't take the proper precautions to secure that data. So that is your cybersecurity tip for the week. And moving right along, uh, obviously this was a short week, but nonetheless, let's get into what nerdy stuff have I been up to this week. Now, there are two kinds of people in this world. I alluded that this was a short week mainly because um, 
I am not recording this on Thursday evening like I generally tend to do because Thursday evening is obviously Thanksgiving and yeah, I don't think you need me to tell you why I'm not recording that day. Um, So with that in mind, being that it's a short week, there are really two kinds of people in this world when when they see a short week. The one person sees the short week and thinks, I won't be able to get as much nerdy stuff done this week because it's a short week. And then you have the other people that say, well, since this is a short week, I'll have to condense all the nerdy things I was planning on doing this week into this condensed timeline, if not more things. And uh, I bet you can't guess where I fell, uh, which camp I fell into this week, which uh, quick surprise trivia question. Uh, bonus trivia question for this episode, which camp did I fall into this week? Now, if you said the latter, that I have to condense all the nerdy things into this compressed timeline, congratulations, you got the bonus trivia question correct. Because, man oh man, um, I honestly thought I might have fallen into the first camp, and then um, this past weekend happened, and yeah, that kind of just went out the window, and I did like a week's worth of stuff in a couple days. Um, So, first off is my video game. So, we start out with the boring and bland, you know, incremental updates, adding some little niceties to the interface, that kind of stuff, you know, boring yawn, I'm going to go take my uh, Thanksgiving leftovers nap right now. But that's not where it gets interesting. Where it gets interesting is I had the idea to completely redo the build system. Not necessarily like 100%, like I didn't scrap my make file and rewrite the thing from scratch, but I did heavily rewrite how the build system works. So before I had mentioned that the reason... So, so before I redid this whole build system, I had to include a library called Raylib. Well, I guess I didn't technically have to, but Raylib is the, was the library I was using to handle all the graphics because initially I had thought about writing my own graphics library for this game, and then upon doing a little bit of research into that, I realized that would be its own massive project in and of itself, so I decided that I would go with a already created graphics library. Anyway... Before, I had pre-included the libraries within my Git repo, which I know, I know that is a horrible idea. You should not include libraries within your Git repo for a few reasons, one of which being it makes your Git repo super bloated because generally libraries are fairly large and take up a lot of space, and if you're constantly updating them, that's a lot of big files and it it's just not a good idea. But the reason I did it was just to make my life easier that whenever I downloaded my source code onto a new computer or something, everything was already there, ready to go. I didn't have to worry about installing any, you know, external libraries or dependencies aside from, you know, the standard build tools that you need to actually, you know, build code. Um, So I didn't have to worry about any of that, which was kind of the main reason I did that. But after a few times of updating the libraries, I figured, you know, and I, I did see, I think, Raylib actually dropped a new release um, of their library anyway, like within, I don't know how recently, but uh, I did notice the the version they had as the latest release was newer than the one I had, and I had already updated the version in my repo at least two times. I think Linux was three times because I had a issue with older, uh, more legacy quote-unquote uh, versions of Linux. But anyway, I decided, you know, I'm just going to build the library from source. And to be honest, this actually provides a lot of benefits. On the one hand, though, it has a drawback, 
of it makes the initial build and compile of the of the game take longer right because now in addition to actually building the game building it building the game from source i also have to build the library the graphics library it depends on from source as well so that obviously takes a little bit of time although because it's a library i really only ever have to build it once and then the only time i would need to rebuild it is if i wanted to update the library with the latest raylib changes um, so that's really the only time i'd actually have to you know rebuild the library so it's not like every time i'm rebuilding you know my project i have to rebuild the library but you know, it is something to consider, at least on, on the first build. Uh, but the other benefit is, one, I don't have to worry about constantly updating the, the Raylib library in my Git repo for the different operating systems. And another benefit is I don't have to worry about one architecture incompatibility and I don't have to worry about glibc incompatibility. So before, one of the issues I ran into was I'm assuming the, the developers of the Raylib library, when they pre-built the libraries and put them in the releases, I'm assuming they built the Linux version, the x86-64 Linux version, I'm assuming they probably built that on Ubuntu 2204 due to um, the version of glibc in Ubuntu 2204, how common Ubuntu is as a Linux distro, um, and the issue I was getting when I was trying to build my game on Red Hat. So when I was trying to build on Red Hat, Red Hat b being an enterprise Linux distribution, all fancy like, um, it has older versions of packages, mainly for stability sake and the whole enterprise thing, yada, yada, yada. Um, but because of that, the... When when they built the um, Raylib library with the newer version of glibc, it added its own like functions or whatever that was specific to that version of glibc that older versions didn't have. So when you tried to run the library, which granted I was using a shared object library at the time, which actually... Uh, Aside from from that, I, I think regardless, it probably still would have caused issues because the library would be still probably pulling from glibc anyway, but that's neither here nor there. The point being, the library didn't work with Red Hat even though it was an x86-64 compatible library. Um, so in layman's terms, the, the architecture that the library was built for is the same architecture that my Red Hat instance was running, meaning that they were both speaking the same language. The problem was the, the, the library was using vocabulary that the Red Hat version didn't quite understand because its dictionary hadn't been updated. That's basically what was going on here. Um, so in order to fix this, I just recompiled the library on the Red Hat instance, and then everything worked fine. So by compiling the library myself, just you know, downloading the source code and building it myself, this is not an issue, because as long as the system that I'm building for is able to build the library, which assuming I've installed all the dependencies, which I had to install anyway to be ordered to install my game because it relies on Raylib, I don't have to worry about the, the graphics library incompatibility anymore. So I can build it on basically any system I want, and also I'm not limited to the architecture. So getting back to the architecture here, one of the limitations that my game had previously was I only included the x86-64 versions of the library for Linux, Windows, and Mac OS. Meaning if I wanted to say try to build this game on an ARM system like my Raspberry Pi, I wouldn't be able to because going back to that, um, that language thing we talked about, 
the Raspberry Pi has an ARM architecture, and ARM is its own instruction set, just like x86 is its own instruction set. We're talking about, like, the CPU level here. So basically, when I would try to compile the code, the library would be an x86, and that is a completely different language than ARM, which is what the Raspberry Pi is expecting. So rather than a vocabulary difference, we're talking about a complete language difference here. So it just would not work. Um, but now, because I'm compiling the library from source, I'm actually able to build my game on my Raspberry Pi. Now, granted, it takes a while, <laughs> you know, building this library from source in addition to building my game from source. So it takes a, takes a little bit, but it can do it, which is definitely something I was never able to do before and I am definitely happy about. Um, so, yeah, it was... A fairly decent overhaul, um, and also because of that, I also had to modify my Ansible playbooks that I use to automatically deploy, um, uh, basically to auto-build for the different architectures, so I can be, you know, developing on a Mac, I could be developing on Windows, I could be developing on Linux, and I could just run this playbook to or run multiple playbooks to automatically deploy my source code um, to one of the other you know environments I want to build for whether that's Linux, Mac OS, or Windows. I can automatically deploy my code there. It'll unpack it, build the code, build the executable, package up all the dependencies, send me back the archived version whether that's a DMG for Mac. Uh, tar.gz for Linux or a zip file for Windows. It'll send me back that file and then boom, just like that, I have the fully built game with all the dependencies and resources it needs included and it's good to go. Um, so the other nice thing about this is because it's now architecture agnostic, thanks to the whole library situation I just spent, I don't know how many minutes talking about, I could theoretically add multiple... Um, operating systems to my deploy scripts, essentially just adding a new host to the Ansible um, hosts file and get binaries for uh, Linux x86, Linux ARM, Mac OS x86, Mac OS ARM, although I don't have a Mac OS ARM device because uh, I don't have Apple Silicon, but you know, in theory I could. Um, and then same thing with Windows, although again, I don't have a Windows ARM device, um, but again, in theory I could. Um, and I had to update the architecture portion of the uh, playbooks because initially I was just hard coding the value because... I mean, if, I, if I'm only going to be able to ever have an x86-64 build for it, I mean, I might as well just hard code the value. Um, but I had to make that modification. So big, big over, uh, overhaul of the build system. But I think it is definitely worth it, uh, especially in the long run. Um, and I'm definitely super, super pumped about that update. And the other update I had was a Proxmox, I wouldn't call it an issue per se, um, but it was something that I was kind of noticing and kind of annoyed at for a while. And this actually has to do with my tried and true champion of my home lab, my R620. Now, those of you who have listened for a while know how, mu how much I love this thing and how it's basically the core of my home lab and runs, I don't know how many VMs, it's somewhere in the teens. Um, but I had issues with it. Not like, it wasn't like groundbreaking or, you know, you know, destroying my home lab issues or anything. But um, basically, I ran out of RAM. I, I have been out of RAM on that thing for a while. And mind you, this thing has 192 gigabytes of RAM. Yet through somewhere in the teens worth of virtual machines, I was completely maxed out on my RAM and completely maxed out 
on the swap. And just as a quick recap on what swap is, swap is a part, a portion of your SSD or hard drive that basically functions as RAM if you're if you run out of actual system RAM. Um, and the main reason that I was concerned about this, I guess we'll say, is for, well, I guess for one thing, if you're using swap, it's obviously going to be a lot slower than RAM, because while the swap is acting as RAM, it's still having to go to your disk, which if you're familiar with how, you know, computer architectures work, you pretty much never want to go to disk if you care about speed and performance because it's a lot slower to go all the way out to disk than it is to you know access cpu cache or even system memory it's a lot slower to have to go back out to disk and back in but that's not even the worst part because our in my in my estimation kind of an even worse aspect is the wear and tear that using a bunch of swap does to your drive, especially an SSD, um, because SSDs, so unlike hard drives where you, it's basically just, you know, a bunch of ones and zeros on a spinning platter and you can just write over them and it's not a big issue, SSDs are have this rating called TBW or terabytes written, um, and they're only rated for a certain number. And if you're using a lot of swap frequently as RAM, you're going to be doing a lot of overwrites to these cells and writing a, and read it, write it, well, specifically writing a bunch of data over and over and over again, which is just asking to wear out your drive a lot faster. Um, so because SSDs use flash memory uh, to store the information, Reading data doesn't really affect them at all because you're just, you know, reading the ones and zeros. Uh, but if you ever want to write data, um, you can't just, you know, overwrite the ones and zeros. You have to completely delete the data that's in the cell where the data is housed and then write the data back. So, yeah, so because of all this, you know, writing to flash, like I said, you can't just overwrite the ones and zeros like you can on a spinning hard drive in order to overwrite the data you have to completely delete all existing data before you rewrite it so this kind of over time slowly degrades these these cells and eventually what causes the ssds to fail once they've reached that reach that you know terabytes written threshold um so yeah, using a lot of swap is generally not ideal. Um, now, as you know, in all reality, you, you, depending on how optimized the system is, you may or may not even notice that you're using swap, but it's just something to take note of. If you're constantly using a lot of swap, uh, you might need to re rethink how you're, you're managing your system's memory. Um, so this, this had been actually going on for, for quite some time now. I don't really remember how long it's been going on, but it's, it's been going on for at least several months. And for, for the life of me, I could honestly never figure out why it was, I was running into this issue because I, on numerous occasions, I counted up how much RAM all my VMs would take up even like taking worst case scenario that they were using the max RAM I allocated for them. And I was honestly never getting anywhere close to 192 gigs, yet somehow I was using more than that for my, for my, you know, my RAM allocation. And I couldn't figure it out because I think the math was adding up to like, I don't even know if it was adding up to like 96 gigs. Well, Actually, I think it probably was more than that, but I was well, one of the calculations I think I did, which was just the current system RAM that each VM was using, I think it came out to like 56 maybe, which I mean, I guess shouldn't be all that surprising when most of my VMs just kind of sit there and do nothing and are basically only using maybe a gig, maybe sometimes a little more, a little less, but I mean, not too much. Um, 
so I, I couldn't figure this out. But then I realized it was because of ZFS. So one thing, if you ever played around with ZFS, one thing ZFS loves is RAM. And it loves it. it. Honestly, it might love RAM more than Google Chrome loves RAM, which is saying something. Because we all know that when you open up two Google Chrome tabs, I mean, boom, your system's already out of RAM. Doesn't matter if you have, you know, 16 gigs or 128 gigs. You open up a few Chrome tabs and your system's sweating because it's running out of RAM. Um, it's obviously a little bit of hyperbole. Um, but ZFS loves RAM. RAM. And specifically, it uses this as kind of like a caching system um, to help improve your performance uh, for your like reads and writes and whatnot. And in some instances, this is actually super beneficial to have, you know, a large RAM cache for your for your, all your drives to be able to easy easily access, you know, different files and whatnot that you tend to access frequently and really speed up those those accesses and those transfers. Um, so, like, I, I had a similar problem, but in reverse on my NAS because on my NAS the ZFS cache was only taking up like half of my system's RAM and I was basically I basically had like 64 gigs of unused RAM and I was like this is not cool I want more of this going to cache um, but on Proxmox I want it kind of the other way because I don't want all of my RAM going to cache because I need that RAM to be used for my VMs so this is one thing you have to know about ZFS. By default, ZFS uses 50% of your RAM. Now, it doesn't use 50% all at once. So when you first, so if you shut down your system and boot it back up, it's obviously not going to take up 50% of your RAM right away. But over the course of you accessing and writing data to your pool, that's where things will be added to the RAM cache and the cache will build up to that 50% mark. Now, there are ways that you can obviously configure this to be more than 50% or less than 50%, but the default is 50%. And like I mentioned, the main reason why you would... The main benefit to it and the main reason why you would want a large cache is to improve your read-write performance of your drives. So if, for instance, you have a uh, a pool of spinning rust, like I do in my NAS, you know, a bunch of hard drives, um, obviously hard drives don't have as good of read-write and input-output performance as SSDs do. So if you have a large RAM cache... Um, the chances of you hitting a, a file that's already in the cache is a lot higher than if your RAM cache was a lot smaller. So, And if you hit something in that cache, then obviously the transfer is going to be a lot quicker. Um, and also, when you're trying to write data to your drives, if you can just write it to that cache, write it directly into RAM, you're obviously going to have a lot faster write speed. And then the, the pool can slowly write that off to the disk um, as needed. So there are definitely uh, some good benefits to have a large ZFS cache. Uh, but like I mentioned, it's not exactly ideal when you're trying to run um, an entire home lab infrastructure uh, alongside that. So... The, the general guideline from what I saw online was you should at least allocate two gigabytes of RAM for the cache as a bare minimum and then add an additional gigabyte per terabyte of storage in your ZFS pool. So one of the examples was if you had eight terabytes of storage in your pool, uh, that would be eight terabytes plus the two for the base. So at min so you w would want at least 10 gigs of RAM set aside for your cache. Uh, but another thing to note, though, is the minimum... It also, in addition to having a max RAM cache, ZFS also has a minimum RAM cache cache which is like i believe 132nd of your system's ram so if you set the max cache to be less than that zfs will just ignore it and not uh and just pretend like it doesn't exist um so if you have you know a server or a hypervisor or something like that that has a ton of ram and you want to 
reduce the size of the ZFS cache, that is one thing you kind of have to be mindful of, um, is if you go too low, even if you're within, you know, the two gigabyte base plus one gig per terabyte, you know, rule, uh, you potentially could be less than the one thirty second uh, for the for the minimum. So basically, what you what you end up doing there is you just have to set the minimum to be uh, to be lower than the maximum you set, and that kind of kind of takes care of things. So with this in mind, I was able to set a new max limit. And now I freed up so much of my RAM <laughs> to the point that I'm now using like around or a little less than half of the of all the RAM on the system. So before I had all 192 gigs of RAM fully utilized plus the 8 gigs of swap fully utilized. Now I'm using like, I, th I forget what exactly it was, but I think it was around like in the, it's somewhere in the 90s of, of gigabytes of RAM. Um, I think once I kind of cleared everything out of swap and, and did the initial reduction, I think I was at around like just under 96 gigs, so right about half, which kind of falls in line because I gave 16 gigs of RAM to the ZFS cache, plus some overhead for Proxmox in general, and then, you know, you add the, the RAM for the VMs, so that, that kind of is more in line with what I was assuming my VMs would actually use as far as RAM is concerned, rather than using all of the RAM on the system. So uh, I guess my bank account can rest easy that I won't be making any more, that I won't have to make any RAM purchases on eBay anytime soon for my R620, so it, it's probably happy about that. Um, so yeah, that was uh, the crazy stuff that I got up to in this condensed week, but seeing that um, it is Thanksgiving, and, you know, obviously you got to be thankful for everything, you know, thankful for the food, the family, the friends, um, everything in your life, your job, you know, all that good stuff, um, but... Instead of, you know, going over all the thankful things, I am going to be like that annoying uncle that you don't like that brings up politics at the Thanksgiving table and committing absolute sacrilege, you know, um, except we're not talking politics. We're talking computer science because I am going to shoehorn computer science into the Thanksgiving conversation um, for a couple reasons. Um, one, I think there's a lot of parallels here which some of them I'm totally just making up and but others actually kind of have a potential decent learning um, aspect to it kind of a, an analogy I guess if you will so the first one being this idea of having things down to a science or planning things out and just going haphazard just you know throwing things at the wall and hoping they stick. Um, now, I'm sure everyone, I'm, I'm assuming that whether it's you or whether some, it's someone you know, you've heard the story that, you know, so-and-so has Thanksgiving down to a science, whether that's their how they make their turkey, their stuffing, their gravy, cranberry sauce, or most importantly, the pies. Um, whatever it is, you've probably heard that saying that, you know, someone has got something, if not the entire Thanksgiving, down to a science. And certain developers are like that as well. Some of them have their developing down to a science. They plan everything out. They have a method to their madness. They do everything in a, in a certain way. And then you have the other developers that just kind of be like, I want to code something. So they just sit at their computer and click clack away like a crazy code monkey on their keyboard, you know, writing code, breaking things, deleting it, trying to make something on the fly and having no planning absolutely at all. And they're just winging it and hoping it works. Um, and I'm sure some people have had that Thanksgiving experience where they have no idea necessarily what they're doing. They don't really have a specific plan. They just kind of have a general idea and they just go at it and hopefully it works. 
Um, I, th- I think we all know some people that are on both sides, uh, possibly developers that fall into both camps. Um, so that is something um, that there is kind of a common a correlation there uh, between Thanksgiving and computer science and software development. But another thing that I also wanted to touch on was I mentioned pies, and arguably one of the most important parts of Thanksgiving is the pie. If it's not the most important part, it is definitely up there. Um, But I would probably argue that it's number one. But it shouldn't come as any surprise to you that we in the computer science world also have pie of our own. But our pie is better in the sense that our pie... Uh, it never runs out. It, it continues on into eternity. We never run out of our pie. And there obviously will come a time, whether it's on Thanksgiving itself or in the days following when you're eating your Thanksgiving leftovers, that your Thanksgiving pie, whether it's apple pie, pumpkin pie, coconut cream pie, some other kind of pie, all of the pie that someone made— There will inevitably come a time when that pie is no more because you ate it all and you become sad. But you must, but then you can remember that as a computer scientist or a software developer, potentially even a math or physics or some other kind of mathy science based field engineering, you have pie, you still have pie. And your pie is eternal and will never end. So you can you can rest assured that you will, regardless, still have pie, even if you can't necessarily eat it and enjoy the taste. Um, but that is some 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 aspects that's similar. But the aspect that I also kind of wanted to touch on and kind of you know provide a little bit of a, a learning experience here is the idea of multi-threading. And yes. Thanksgiving has multi-threading, and arguably probably a lot of it, Um, but it also has other things, too, like building libraries, Um, and, and you're probably wondering how the heck does Thanksgiving involve building libraries? The, the, the two have nothing to do with each other. But, but let, me, let, me, let me explain here. But let's touch on first the easy one, which is multi-threading. And I think this is probably kind of easy to see because generally speaking, at least in the Thanksgivings that I've observed, there's never an instance where, you're co- where something is being cooked and then they wait until that uh, piece of food or whatever dish is completed before they move on to the next thing, right? Like generally, what I've seen at least is, you know, you have your turkey going in the oven. You have one or two different things on the stove going at the same time. Um, you have someone or maybe even the same person, you know, preparing something else over on the counter. There's a lot of different things going on at the same time. And you can kind of think of this as multi-threading, right? Because you're doing things concurrently all at the same time to improve the overall performance of your Thanksgiving to make sure things are able to complete in a certain amount of time. Because could you imagine the absolute travesty Thanksgiving would be if you could only do one thing at a time? Could you imagine the absolute havoc and, you know, uproar and riots in the streets that would happen if you had the entire family coming over for Thanksgiving and, you know, you weren't cooking any of the sides or anything because the turkey was still in the oven. And then the turkey finally got out of the oven, but then you have to put other things in the oven like the stuffing or the pies or whatever. So you put them in and then and then once they're done, then you then you go start making the mashed potatoes. And then once the mashed potatoes are done, then you start making the vegetables. And then, you know, and you do all this sequentially. I mean, my goodness, if the day isn't already over, uh, the food's going to be cold by the time everything gets ready, right? So you obviously have to have some kind of idea of doing things concurrently or multi-threading just like you would do in programming. Uh, because there now obviously there are some instances right where doing things sequentially is faster 
So if if something is a really quick dish or it takes a lot of, you know, hands-on time, it's probably going to be less optimal to try to do multiple things at the same time if, you know, a certain task needs to be done, you know, sequentially. Um, so this is where you could kind of rope in the idea of multiprocessing as well or using multiple cores at the same time rather than just multiple threads. Um, now, obviously, multiprocessing would kind of assume that you had someone else in the kitchen cooking with you. Um, now, obviously, there's, you know, that saying of too many cooks in the kitchen. Some people get mad if other people are kind of in their way. Um, but, you know, kind of that being the idea of, you know, a little bit of a difference there between the strictly multi-threading aspect and the multi-processing, especially if we're talking like a Python instance where, you know, multi-processing is like specifically for doing things on multiple cores and multi-threading is essentially one core just doing multiple things uh, at the same, not necessarily at the same time, but, you know, switching between them. Whereas that's kind of in contrast to like a C or C++ where multi-threading is basically the same thing as multi-processing, unless you want to get into like forking processes, but that's kind of a little bit different. Um, but specifically, you know, the multi-threading aspect with C++, it can obviously run on multiple cores. It's not necessarily specifically um, for one core. Uh, but anyway, that's, you know, the, the kind of the idea that, you know, there are some instances in coding where it doesn't make any sense to try to do things concurrently because, you know, the overhead and... Um, Depending on what you're doing, you might run into potential race conditions, so you'd have to add locks, which cause even more, you know, overhead of threads waiting on one another. So there is obviously instances where multi-threading makes things slower, just like, you know, when you're trying to prep stuff, there is are instances where if you're trying to joggle too many things at once, you could end up slowing things down or burning things or, you know, whatever the case may be. But there are definite instances when it comes to prepping the Thanksgiving Day feast uh, where multi-threading definitely makes a serious impact to making sure that the food gets ready on time. Now, I also mentioned the library aspect of you know, the whole idea of, you know, pre-compiling a library and you might be scratching your head. How does that make any sense? But have you ever had a Thanksgiving where you either made something the night before or maybe even a couple days before and then on Thanksgiving you just reheated it? Or you had or someone else brought over a dish to have at your Thanksgiving? I mean, I don't know about you guys, but to me, that sounds awfully a lot like a pre-compiled library, if you ask me. Because if it's you that did it beforehand, that sounds to me like you wrote the library ahead of time, and then you used it in your actual program, of course, your program being Thanksgiving, and the other hand being someone brought, you know, a dish, whether they brought the the pies, or they brought the, the green bean casserole, or they brought the stuffing, or whatever the case is, you know, they brought their own dish that you then incorporated into the Thanksgiving Day feast. I don't know. That's to me, that sounds like, you know, you were strolling on GitHub looking for some library to do something that you didn't want to write the code for, found a good library, downloaded it and incorporated that into your program. And then you might be thinking, well, wait a second. What if you have to like reheat something or something like that? Well, that's where the linker comes in because just because you have the pre-compiled library doesn't mean you can just, you know, go ahead and do stuff. You have to, you know, link it into your program and, you know, add the add the include file and then, you know, you call the functions and whatnot. And then when you compile the code at the end, when you're linking everything together, then you link in that library. Um, so, you know, the other person already did all the work. You're just at the end when you're putting everything together on Thanksgiving, you're reheating that dish or whatever the case is, and it's good to go. So I don't know about you guys, but to me, while some people argue Thanksgiving it isn't really a like it's 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 a cooking holiday right it's that that's basically the whole point of thanksgiving some people would argue that it's just for cooking 
I would kind of argue that all of this is just an analogy, a very abstract, but as you saw in this episode, we kind of pulled back that curtain, and in reality, it might not actually be about food at all. In reality, it's all about, you know, software development and computer science, if you ask me, because, I mean, it's got multi-threading, it's got pre-compiled libraries, it's got pie in it. I mean, come on. I mean, if that... If 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 the multi-threading aspect wasn't a big enough dead giveaway, and the 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 pre-compiled library aspect of people bringing over dishes and you incorporating them into one larger program or f- meal, if you will, uh, if that wasn't a big enough giveaway, I mean, it has pie in it, right? Thanksgiving has pie. It's like the staple. I mean, if that's not like, you know, the big flashing button saying like, look at me, I'm about computer science. I mean, I, I don't know what to tell you because I, I think at this point we we've, we've clearly defined that uh, Thanksgiving is not about food. It's not about cooking. It is indeed a just one great analogy for computer science. So whoever it was back whenever you know Thanksgiving got all the traditions that it did, they were definitely way ahead of their time. And I think, who knows, they might have even been like a time traveler or something that uh, was from the future and they were trying to, you know, mask you know these principles and ideas into thanksgiving so that someone down the line won't have to reinvent the wheel and they can instead pull from these ideas that they encoded into thanksgiving to just be an analogy for things that we use in software development and computer science um so we don't have to you know come up with them with ourselves we can see them you know from thanksgiving so time traveler out there i see you Uh, Who knows? Maybe it was me. I don't know. Um, But I see you. um, And we have definitely unpacked the truth about Thanksgiving. So I hope you enjoyed this kind of little fun tangent uh, that we kind of went on. Um, Obviously, this all being in good fun. I hope that you and all of your friends and family had a fantastic Thanksgiving, uh, got to spend some quality time with each other, and had hopefully had some pretty good food as well. And with that, I think we should get back to our special trivia question for this week, which is the following audio comes from which operating system and I'll play that again for you right here If you said Windows 98, congratulations, you got this special audio trivia question correct. And specifically, this uh, little bit of audio from Windows 98 is the kind of, I guess, the welcome music, uh, if you will, that plays when you, uh, after you first installed Windows 98 and are logging in for the first time and kind of gives you that, you know, welcome to Windows menu type thing, you know, um, that's where this, this audio plays, so... Hopefully you got that right. It was probably a throwback for some of you. Probably haven't heard it in a while. Um, But uh, yeah, so that was the trivia question. If you enjoyed this kind of new uh, trivia question format of, you know, potentially adding things like audio into it, let me know. Uh, Contact at darkassassinsinc.com. This was kind of something I just thought would be fun, so I, I decided to throw it in there. Um, But if you have any questions or topics or comments for future episodes, you can, of course, shoot me an email at contact at darkassassinsinc.com. And also be sure to share this uh, episode around, subscribe to the podcast, all that good stuff. Leave a rating if you enjoyed it. And that's going to do it for me in this episode of the Dark Assassins podcast. Until next time, my fellow assassins, remember, bull nothing equals true. If action not equal to null, return true. I'll see you next time on the Dark Assassins Podcast.